Hi guys, this is Sandy from Appreciating Autoimmunity. I think we got a lot of sun here, so let me just see. How's that for you? A little bit better. Just got to lean back. Okay, so it's taken me a little bit to get my next video up. And us kids are just haven't been feeling well. And as you know, with uh, autoimmunity, you have good days and you have bad days. So, mm, for the last little bit, I've had, I've been really busy, very, very busy, but I've had some issues. So, today what I want to do is I want to talk to you uh, about how my autoimmunity came on. Um, we also want to watch our time here because I want to try to keep my videos to about half an hour long. So, i got to keep an eye here. I'm going to set my watch or my alarm here and when we hear 20 minutes then we will know that we got to start wrapping it up so let me see um oh boy okay all right 15 minutes 20 minutes there we go all right so guys ladies gents whatever whoever i'm speaking with that's you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I wanted to talk about how the autoimmunity affected me because I'm thinking there's a lot of you out there that probably have autoimmunity and you don't even know it yet. And I struggled immensely, like really hard. Um, my doctors, I would go to doctor's appointments to hospitals, my mom would take me, my dad, my stepmom, everybody that was involved. And they didn't know what was going on. Everything was kind of crazy. I gotta stay back, because if I go forward, the light or the sun is gonna shine bright. But, um, okay, so the way we will describe it, I'll go back to being born as a little baby. Um, my mom did have German measles when she was pregnant for me, but that, that doesn't mean that this, this was her fault. She didn't do anything. She didn't know. Um, and nobody else did. And you know what? She gives herself enough grief um, with her own personal guilt from that that that's the last thing I want for her. So um, we're not going to blame my mom. I'm just saying that she had German measles when she was pregnant for me. And that can cause problems when a baby is developing. Just as you all know, any, any illness can affect a pregnancy. So it ended up happening that I was born with more bowel than the normal person. Like I had, I don't know how many feet there are in your intestines, but let's say, let's just say 150 feet. Okay, I had like 250 feet. It was a crazy amount. Um, but we didn't actually know it until later on in life. But from early, early days of my babyhood, I struggled with constipation. And then as I got younger, sorry, my phone just went off there. Uh, or I mean, as I got older and was more aware of the problem, I got shy. I got bowel shy. And that wasn't very good for me at all. But, so that was one problem I had. And then, I started having symptoms where I would wake up in the middle of the night with migraine headaches. And this is still like young, young, young. And I used to uh, throw up a lot violently and I also got blood clots and it was crazy they would have to rush me into the hospital for these migraines and I always puked violently with it and what did the doctors do at a young young age they would give me an injection of a narcotic and then they would send me home and then my mom was left to deal with the mess and so she kept taking me to doctors and trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Not to say that 
you know, I was a bad girl or anything like that. It's just there's issues. And what are these underlying issues? And everybody knew that we weren't making these issues up. They were clearly there. Um, the blood clots, you could see. Like, I would get a bang and boom. My leg would have a huge bump and a big bruise and it would be very painful. So it was there, like they saw the evidence. But I went through so much um, in my life where doctors would say, it's an all in her head syndrome. She's making this up to get attention. As I got a little bit older, they would say things like, she's um, making these up to get attention and she's um, malingering for narcotics. And I'm telling you, the devastation that that caused me growing up was awful because I knew deep inside in my heart of hearts that I was not making any of this up. None of these pain situations and none of the issues. But, you know, when there was doctors that didn't know and didn't have answers, what is one to say or to think? So some of my family kind of fell into that role in thinking she is making it up or it is just an attention grabber seeker or she does have drug issues, you know, but that that's crazy. So I just want to tell you, if you're going through those sort of things, no, you don't allow that, okay? It's wrong. If you know in your heart of hearts that there is something deeply going on in your body and you're not making these things up. You need to become proactive and you need to find the right help to help you get a proper diagnosis. So, it started out for me with endometriosis and I would have no periods for months on end. Like I would go six months without a period. Um, and then all of a sudden, I would bleed, and I would bleed for 30, 40, 50 days, and it would be very, very heavy, and I would get anemic, and I would get terrible, terrible pain, and finally at 13 years of age, they decided to do a laparoscopy, which is just where they go in and look around, and that's when I was diagnosed with the endometriosis. And I was actually told by my family doctor at that point that I most likely would never be able to have children. What a terrible thing to tell a young child of that age who can't process adult issues. And that crushed me because in my life, I love children. I loved babies. In fact, I wanted to go to school to be a neonatal nurse. That's what I wanted to do. So I was devastated and I luckily was able with my husband to do infertility treatments at a very young age and able to conceive my two boys that I have right now who are the fire under my feet and always have been. But so I gotta get back here to our I'm at um, with the disease process. So one night I was 24 years old. Yeah, 24. Uh, maybe 23. But um, my husband and I, uh, we always had crazy things going on with me because I was not your textbook material type of gal. My body did not act the way most people's bodies did. And so I went to bed. I felt fine. Things seemed to be okay. But I woke up in the morning and I looked awful. I had a fever of 106. My joints, like my knuckles, had big balls on them. And same with these joints, big balls. My neck was so swollen, I had nodules like it looked like coming out of here. It was crazy. My eyes were swollen shut. And I had like, my whole body was just in agony. So, 
And of course, I had this fever of 106, and I had a really, really sore throat where I, I could hardly talk. And I was never one to get sore throat, so this was new for me. So, of course, we went into a merge where I had a terrible reputation because people always thought that I was there um, making these things up to get attention. But how do you make something up? when you've got a fever of 106 and you look like uh, the elephant man, where you have swelling areas in your body that just isn't normal to happen overnight. But it did. And they knew right away that this obviously was an arthritic type reaction. They weren't sure exactly what was going on, but they did some blood work and it led them to believe that there was something going on with an autoimmunity. Well, with my endometriosis, I had some of the best docs in Canada. Actually, my doctor, Dr. Cliff Liebrach, who I searched out, um, he's from Toronto, Ontario, and he still to this day is the number one specialist in endometriosis. So if you have endometriosis, Go see Cliff Liebrock and tell him Sandy Lee Stinchcomb sent you because he is my savior as far as endometriosis went. Okay, so there's that. But because he was such a good guy and he worked with me like as a team together, um, my husband called him and told him what was going on. And he said, like, get her down here right away. Like, this isn't something to fool around with. So my husband drove me, and we got to see a rheumatologist. And sure enough, it turned out I had lupus. And it was systemic lupus erythematosus, which means it's not just a skin disease. It's actually in the blood. So what had happened was I had come down with strep throat. And I also had a kidney infection. And if you'll remember from my first video, I had said that I was having constant kidney infections. I also had um, kidney stones and had a lot of, um, what do you call it, hospitalizations for those infections. Okay, I'm trying to turn here to get away from that sun. I'm trying to use it for good light. But you know what? I'm purchasing actually purchased it's just on the way um a ring on a tripod because if you saw the way that I have this set up now you'd laugh at me because I just have a bunch of boxes all stacked up and then my video just there choo -choo, just had to make it work the best way I could okay so anyways it took them uh with lupus it does take a long time to officially diagnose the disease but we knew that I was having um, allergy to the sun, which was all my life. I dealt with that problem forever. Um, then I had an uh, uh, antibody in my blood, uh, which is an antibody, which is a protein, I believe, that is made in your body and your immune system attacks it. So basically, what lupus is, is well, any autoimmunity really, but for lupus, it thinks that all of your healthy good cells are actually invader bad cells and your immune system attacks those and then it allows all the bad invader unhealthy cells to take over and that's where the damage gets done in your body. And for me, it was my kidneys that really got attacked. Um, and it's still to this day. Is, but um, I'm doing a lot better than I have been in the past. And that's just because of all of the natural ways that I have changed. So um, it took them six months to come down with the official diagnosis uh, you have to have out of a whole total of like a whole mirage of symptoms. You have to have at least 12 of the symptoms 
uh, with this antibody in your blood. Uh, and, and one of them is you have to have the allergy to the sun, which I did. Um, a skin issue, which I did. I was having terrible skin issues. Still do to this day. Um, and then, you know, joint issues. Joint pain, joint swelling. So mine was rheumatoid arthritis. And, I mean, it was awful. I had to learn how to walk again. I had to have an occupational therapist and a physiotherapist come to the home and work with me. We did, um, what do you call it? Those, you know, the wax that you melt down into a warm um, container that you plug it in. Well, I'd do these treatments where I'd put my hands in there. It was the only way I could get any relief from the pain because my joints were so just just messed up but I'm lucky to say that uh, with changing my health in the ways that I have I don't suffer and haven't had too many lupus issues other than a severe dry skin and uh, runny watery eyes I do get that a lot um, I'm doing very well as far as the lupus goes um, I still deal with chronic pain, and I hope that that uh, will be an issue of the past sooner than later. I'm going through a process. Okay, nope, the sun's not going down yet. <laughs> okay, where are we? It gives you good light, but hey, it's not the kind of light we want. So, um, so that's what happened with me, and. So then I got these letters from my doctors in Toronto and I continued to be treated by those dots down there. And my rheumatologist, her name is Dr. Daphna Gladman. Hi Daphna. Um, she's at Toronto Western Hospital and they specialize with um, rheumatology over there. So if you were dealing with an autoimmune issue and you needed a rheumatologist, they have an excellent uh, clinic there and they are world renowned and they get people that come all over the world to get treated or to get even tested because it's so hard to identify autoimmune disease. It, it can mimic many, many things. So um, they started treating me in the hospital and um, like I said, it took them six months total to come up with the actual diagnosis, but they believed that's what it was, so they started treating me anyway, and the treatments were working. Like, that obviously was the right diagnosis because I was responding to those treatments. But, man, it was hard. And, you know, I, I lived on pain medications and... I still take pain medications and I hate it. I really do. Um, I've gone off of them quite a few times. Cold turkey just said that's it. Stop it. And I haven't had any problems. But I want to talk to you today. Uh, so now that I've introduced to you the way that the lupus um, affected me. I just wanted you to know so that for yourselves or any of you that are struggling with issues and you haven't got a diagnosis yet that um, this is the way it came out in me. Oh, and the other factor was that strep throat and a kidney infection are two triggers that can affect or, uh, or trigger the lupus in your body to come alive. There are certain diseases that we all carry uh, in our body, but they lie dormant and so there's certain situations like strep throat or kidney infection could trigger it and that's what made it come to life. Well, <laughs> my luck, of course, was I got both. Uh, so it was a double whammy. And uh, just typical me, I've never been textbook. I've always done things weird and always stumped the doctors. But it was a little bit of a turning point for me because I had a lot of um, letters from my doctors and I had a lot of reports 
um, proof, basically. And I would bring them to our local hospital because, you know, we live three hours away from Toronto. And when there was a problem, we just couldn't drive to Toronto if it was serious. So I had to make a relationship somehow with these doctors in my city. And, and it wasn't easy. And it went on for a long time. Even with the diagnosis and with all of the reports that I carried around, I used to have a bag like this big. And I carried it with me everywhere I went because I was so paranoid of being treated that way and being told that it wasn't real, that it wasn't, that it was in my head and that I was making these things up and that I was malingering for drugs. So I carried these files with me everywhere I went and especially when I went to our local emergency department because I wasn't going to have them call me that again. But it did happen and it happened a lot. So... I hope one day, by doing what I'm doing, you know, some people, they could sue and make money and, and try to change the system that way. Well, that isn't the way I work. The way I work is I want to tell my story. I want it to be heard. I want to be able to offer help to some of you and then hopefully make changes within our local system so that none of you have to suffer the way that I did. That's the way that I want to make the change. And then it turned out to be good that I kept all my records because I'm writing my book and it's my life story. It's taken me a long, long time to get to the point where I've been ready to write it. But I think that why that happened is because timing is everything, right? I believe that I wasn't ready. I started writing it, then I would have things happen to me physically, and I would get writer's block. I just couldn't do it. Whereas now, I'm doing so much more natural healing that I'm in a better place. My mind is clear, my focus is there, and I don't have writer's block. So it's, it's all in the timing. I'm doing my my YouTube channel, Appreciating Autoimmunity. And I feel that by doing this, now is the time to kind of continue writing. And having all of those files has really come useful for me because I can go back and look at the dates and basically write my story. But I also have always journaled. And that is one thing that I really want you to do is journal. If you don't journal, that's okay. But if you want to take a new approach to your healing and get better, I really push that you start journaling. And I directed my journals to God like I was writing him a letter. Um, you don't have to do that. You can just do it as if you're writing on paper just to yourself. It's okay. I just choose to write to God because he is my director, right? And he's who saved me. Um, and I'm a believer. So, I mean, how could I not be a believer? 53 surgeries, a spinal cord injury that paralyzed me from the waist down, I've lost many of my organs, including the bowel, the small and large intestine. Not all of it, but a large portion. And I lost my bladder, my appendix, um, and I had multiple um, endometrial implant uh, surgeries where they removed the disease. I actually even had surgery where I was awake on the table. Can you believe that? It was awful. Anyway, um, but to be able to survive all of that, the only way for me, in my heart, I believe, is through the Lord and Jesus Christ, my Savior. And you know, every time I would go in the hospital, before I would hit the hospital doors, my mom and I, or whoever I was with, my son, whatever, 
we would pray. And I would pray that the Lord promised me that he would take care of me. So I wanted him to come with me on this journey and that he would touch the hands of all the doctors and nurses and anyone else in between so that he would guide them and so they would know how to take care of me. And what that did for me was it allowed me to go in peacefully and not freak out, especially before surgeries, because my surgeries have always been long and complicated. But I would have a peace over me and I'd recover and it's just amazing testimony to say that he was there and he always has been there for me. So, okay, so now I've talked to you about journaling. I want you to do that but today now, and we're not gonna go on for too much longer, but I want to give you some validation for pain. This is a very, very serious subject, okay? I understand what it's like to be told when you have extreme pain that you don't and that you're making it up. In fact, it brings tears to my eyes just thinking about it because it's, it's emotionally draining, it's physically draining, it's spiritually draining to already have to deal with the pain, but then to have people tell you such nasty negative things. It's just wrong, okay? So with that, I want you to know that I understand your pain and I understand that you're not making it up. The ones of you that are making it up that are doing it for attention because believe me there are people that do do it and that's the problem it's like one bad apple makes all the other good apples go bad so that's what happens in the system for the rest of us so you have to understand that there are people out there that do do that and it's a sad situation but that's not where we are today. Today I am here telling you that I understand your pain and I'm here to validate your pain, okay? This was told to me when I was in the hospital for my spinal cord rehab. So I was out of the hospital, but I was gone to spinal cord rehabilitation. And I was approached by a couple of girls who ran a pain program called the LEAP program. And now I wanna tell you, this program was amazing. But first they came in to talk to me and they sat down and explained what pain was. And I, after they told me what it was, I literally bawled. Like, I broke down into a million pieces. And it was like, God sent those girls to me that day. Because my whole life, I carried that. I carried that pain of that, um, I'm sorry, but that pain of thinking that it wasn't real and that there was something really wrong with me and that I was making it up. It took such a toll on me emotionally and I knew that I was right. I knew I wasn't faking it. But the thing is, is your emotions play games with you and they played such games with me and even laying there, not being able to move my legs, being in the excruciating pain I was in, 
I still thought I was making it up. And these ladies told me, no, I wasn't making it up. They explained exactly what pain really is and that it's a true scientifically proven system problem in you. So they asked me if I wanted to take this course. So I'll show you. It's the LEAP program and it's called Pain Management. Now this was um, meant for people with spinal cord or spinal cord like injuries. But every single thing in this course relates to pain regardless, okay? So it was a nine week course. I started it in rehab and even when I returned home, I would go back weekly for my classes. And I learned so much, you guys, so much, that it gave me the strength and the courage to be able to want to help you. Not only help myself and to teach my family and my friends what I was going through and what they were thinking about me was wrong. But it, you know, it didn't even matter about proving them wrong because it just mattered that I was validated. Because here I am, what was I, 47 years old when I had my spinal cord injury. So you think 47 years of taking that blaming and that horrific, emotional trauma that it did to me that's a lot of years of strong of stress but we okay so that okay how can I say this for the people that have real true pain we call it chemical P it is released there's a chemical that is is released in your system and what it does is it, it, it causes uh, your nervous system so we'll talk about that too your vasal vagal response which is in your nervous system and it goes all the way through your body well it's called fight or flight syndrome and when you have something wrong in your body, it sets the fight or flight syndrome off to, to say to your body, there's something wrong. So there's two reactions. You either can flight, fly away, like run away from it, or fight, do something about it. So most people do something about it and they go to get help. And that's what you're supposed to do. But you can freeze or try to fly away or freeze and not know what to do. And then that causes anxiety. It causes a myriad of things. But chemical P, I'm going to show you a picture um, that can help explain to you what it does. Um, but basically... It affects your brain. So I'm going to take this workbook that I have here. And I want you to see the cortex in your brain here. Okay? And I'm going to read this out. But what happens is chemical P latches on to here. The first response of your pain. Okay? And I have to put my glasses on for this. So excuse me, but what happens is these are the functions. So it depends on where the chemical P goes to in your brain, but there are areas of the brain that it goes to. Remember the map I showed you here, okay? And they're numbered, they're all numbered. So let's just say one, it goes to the premotor cortex. The function is organize and prepare movements 
Well, when you have pain and it's affecting that area in your brain, that chemical P, you have problems in your mind where you can't organize things, you can't organize your thoughts, you, you have problems with your moving. It does that. But then it goes on to say your number two, which would be your cingulate cortex. And those functions are concentration and focusing. So when you're having true pain, can you concentrate? Uh, no, I can't. I couldn't. Can you focus? No, because all you focus on is the pain. Okay, so then we have number three, which is the prefrontal cortex, which is in here. That is problem solving and memory. So think about that. You have pain, true pain. Can you problem solve? Can you try to figure out a way to make yourself better? Probably not. Can you remember what's going on? Probably not. It's probably why you reach out to someone and tell them what's going on because you can't figure things out. Your mind is starting to go loopy, right? Okay, so then, then we have the amygdala. Not everybody is gonna understand these terms. But it doesn't matter. You'll understand when I tell you what these areas of the brain do for you. So the amygdala, fear, anxiety, anticipation. Tell me, the ones of you that have severe pain, do you suffer fear? Do you suffer anxiety? Do you suffer anticipation? Well, that part comes with fight or flight, with the vagal nerve response. So if you don't do something about it, it's just going to recirculate and keep going on and hurt you. Okay, so then we've got five, which is your sensory cortex. And that is identifying what body parts are affected. Well, can you figure out, when you're, when you're in this much pain, can you actually figure out what body parts are affected? No, for me, it was just a matter of knowing, uh, hey, I got pain here in my back, or I have pain in my joints, or pain in my head, or wherever the areas were, but I didn't know what was the problem area, what was being affected. I couldn't because my brain was going nuts. So then you have, okay, you've heard of this maybe, is the hypothalamus. Okay, so this is your stress response and your autonomic regulation. Or sorry, did I say autonomic? Auto, yeah, autonomic regulation. So you can't control the stress. That chemical pee is playing games in your head. So it's affecting all your emotions. It's affecting the things you do. It's affecting you. It just is. And we're going to continue on here because then we have the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is movement and cognition. Anybody that suffers with acute or chronic pain, can they have proper movement and cognition? Could you, if somebody read to you a bunch of words, like, okay, for instance, I'd say, remember this. I want you to remember purple, move, soccer ball, time, rosemary. And then we'll have a conversation and five minutes later I ask you, what were those words I just said to you? Could you repeat them back to me? Your cognition is gone. You can't. That is a problem. That is what pain does. So if you think you're messed up, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And I want you to understand that. Now, we also have the hypocampus. And that is your memory. 
It's not your fault. Then we have the brain stem, which is the back area where I told you. And it relays all the messages to the brain. And what's the very first place that I told you? Chemical P effects. Right there. Whoops, right there, the brain stem. Relays messages to and from the brain. So, with this, I want you to know it is not your fault. You are suffering from a condition that you can't control. It takes control of you. Now, you can do things about it that you can take control, but that is going to take a lot of work. And this is where I'm trying to lead you in the direction that you need to get the right help, okay? So we're doing this slowly because we're doing it in steps. And I'm taking you from I'm taking you from all of my personal experiences and all of the things that I learned to shape what it is you need to do. So first of all, give yourself a hug. And if you need to have a good cry, have a good cry. Because that's what I did when I was validated. That pain is real. Now, I had a pain specialist, that's Arsenio Avila, Dr. Arsenio Avila. I've had others. I've had um, Dr. Anwar Morgan, and hi, buddy. <laughs> uh, you know I love you. And he worked with Dr. Lee Brack, Cliff Lee Brack. Hey, Cliff. You know, our love signal. I miss you. These guys are my friends, okay? And they worked with me for years and years. And they know me, and they knew that I wasn't making these things up. But narcotics are not good for you. And those people that, I need to explain this part. Narcotics are there for a reason. Because when there are no other ways to work with dealing with the pain, that's what they're there for. But if you don't have true pain, and you're doing it to get high, you don't produce chemical P, okay? So what happens is, when you produce chemical P, when you're having true pain, your, your brain or your nervous system makes receptors, and the receptors are what the drug can grab onto and hold onto. But when you don't have true pain, chemical P, you don't have that natural receptor that will grab onto the drug. So what happens is your body has to make um, fake receptors. So where you would normally have a receptor, just imagine like having little, little kind of squiggly things that come down and make their own little fake receptors. It has to happen because the drug has to go somewhere. It just doesn't float around in your body. It has to have a receptor to go to. So when you're abusing the drug, it goes to these basically man-made receptors so that it has somewhere to hold on to. But that's where addiction comes in, okay? And the addiction part is not the physical, like when you have true pain, your body needs it, right? So it takes it and you get relief and you feel better and you can relax and sleep. And for me right now, my pain medication makes it so I can function. And I still have good clarity. I'm not like doped out because I'm not abusing it. But the people that do abuse it, what happens is 
those receptors, because they're not producing chemical P, it, it craves that drug. So then they do anything in their power to get that drug. And that's addiction. And um, when you have true pain and you're taking medications properly and you're not abusing the situation, you actually can come off medications and not have serious withdrawals because you're doing it for the right reasons. Your body is making the chemicals and the response the receptors for it to go to and that is why I have been able to come off of the drugs three or four different times and was fine but you do have a little bit of physical effect because your body is getting something right but the addiction problem which is up here in your brain is where it's craving it craving it craving it um, you can have severe withdrawals and you can have severe uh, motor brain cortex issues where you can have hallucinations, you can have seizures, ter some terrible, terrible things can happen. Um, so I totally, I don't support being on narcotics forever, no. You need to find things to help you and you need to find ways to cope and you need to use them only in the context of when you can't you can't function now don't get me wrong I understand that in order to function you might need your pain meds but have it in the back of your head you plan on doing something, trying new things so that you can eventually come off of them because narcotics aren't meant forever and they in themselves will cause a lot of other health issues down the road, especially if you're on them for long term. And we'll get there, we'll get there. But right now I just want you to know about pain, what pain is, and I'm not here to talk to the people that are addicted. That's a whole nother ball game. And that's a whole nother set of people that are trained. I am not trained in that area. I am only trained to understand what I went through. Now I had my pain specialist, Dr. Avila, um, Arsenio Avila from uh, Sunnybrook. All of my guys now are at Sunnybrook. And um, he had a nurse practitioner that worked for him, Jason Sawyer. Hi, Jace. <laughs> you know how I feel about you. I don't even need to tell you because I know you know. And I, I respect him so much. In fact, I hoped one day he'd be my husband, but that didn't work out. So, but I respect him with every piece of me because from 2012 until just not too long ago, I haven't really seen him in the last um, two years, three years. I didn't really needed him. But um, he was there for me by my side every single day. When I was in that hospital, he was the one that took care of me. He fought for me. He spoke up for me. He advocated for me through everything, even the spinal cord injury. He was the one that advocated to the spinal cord rehab place, which is world renowned. And they only take people that you just don't get to get in. No, no, you have to be approved and they have to know that you are really gonna try hard. So he advocated for me. He it was, it was unbelievable. He made a phone call and he talked to them. And he said, if there is any person, any one person that could recover and that would recover, it's this girl, Sandy, and you need to take her because she will prove to you that she can do it. Do you know, most people have to wait weeks, weeks and weeks. We got the call the very next day and they took me in. And that was because of what Jason did for me. 
So I have a lot of appreciation for Jason. Yes, my heart got intertwined too. And I do love him. I will always love him because he has supported me and he's helped me and he's walked me through so much. Um, but these are the kind of people that you need in your life when you are going through pain symptoms and disease. You need the proper people who can walk you through the right steps that can help you. They can give you the right medications. And let me tell you, today is not like it was in the 80s or even the early 90s. There are so many more uh, scientific studies that have been done about pain. There are so many different medications and there are so many ways of coping through it. This, this course that I took is one of them. There's so much that can be done about pain. There is absolutely no reason for you to be afraid to admit that you have pain. And there's absolutely no reason to feel that you're going to be judged like I was. Because now in school, in university, when they teach these guys who are becoming doctors or nurses, Jason was a nurse practitioner, but he also specialized in pain. And he actually works on the board, um, the American Board of uh, Nursing uh, Acute and Chronic Pain. And he's the eject lecturer at UFT. Plus, he runs the acute pain service at Sunnybrook with Arsenio. And that's a big job. But anyway, I don't want to continue going on and on and on about Jason because this is about pain. So... But he was just a very big part of my life. And he always will be. Even if I never see him again. He always will be. And I hope to see him. Lots of times if I go for my appointments. I always try to make rounds. And go say hi to my, my people. My peeps. Because <laughs> I love them. Um, they're amazing. Leslie Carr. Dr. Leslie Carr. Uh, Kim Abarico. Her sister. She's her secretary. All of the girls in the clinic there. Then there's Dr. Sander Hirschhorn. Hey, dude, you know I love you too. Um, Dr. Nam. Oh my, you saved me big time. Then there's Dr. Fred Brenneman. He's a general surgeon, a trauma surgeon. And oh my gosh, the things he's done for me. I can't tell you. I could go on and on forever. I'm not going to, but because we need to bring this to a close. But to the next video that I make we are going to talk about breathing because breathing exercises are going to be your next tool so what have we gone over today we've gone over how the autoimmune disease showed up in me how it can affect you the symptoms the signs um, we've talked about pain and what it really is and that it's it's true, it's real, it's not in your head, and it's not fake, okay? We, we've talked about that. We know that you, it's not your fault, okay? So take that and run with it. Do not let anybody put that in your head and make you suffer even more, okay? Then, so we've talked about all the areas in the brain that when you have two pain, what it fun what it does, what it messes up, so that you can't even think right. You can't do anything but lay there and roll around and cry or moan, right? For me, I was a moaner. But, okay, so we talked about that. And we talked about advocating for yourself. Don't let these guys try to rule the roost. You need to reach out. If you need to get online, search for doctors. I've given you some references. Rheumatology is Toronto Western Hospital. They are one of the best in rheumatology and especially if you have lupus or um, like rheumatoid arthritis, anything that affects and makes antibodies in your immune system that suppresses it or makes it act wrong in you. Go there. Um, research those people 
uh, Dr. Daphne Gladman. That was the doctor from Toronto Western Hospital. There's others. There's Dr. Murray Urowitz. He works with Dr. Daphne Gladman as a team, and they run that whole clinic at Toronto Western Hospital. So then we have, I've told you about Dr. Cliff Liebrach. He is the head of um, infertility and gynecological issues, and he is the number one man for um, endometriosis. He trained under his dad and Dr. Kai Lee, and Dr. Kai Lee used to be the number one big guy, big wig in Canada for endometriosis, and Dr. Liebrock uh, took over for him. So there is a resource, okay? And he's at Women's College Hospital. So if you're dealing with endometriosis or any kind of infertility or uh, gynecological issues, look at Women's College Hospital. That's a place for you to resort to. Now, I've given you two pain doctors, Dr. Anwar Morgan. He is at uh, Women's College Hospital. You can research him, and yes, you can use my name, okay, because he will know. You might, uh, I, I go under, it's Sandy Lee Stinchcomb, but you can also use the last name Dale, because that is my married name. I am divorced, but I've kept it, because that's what my kids wanted. So, okay, so that's, I've given you those resources. Now, over at Sunnybrook, we have, oh, and there's, sorry, Dr. Arsenio Avila, he works out of Women's College Hospital, but he does travel back and forth from Sunnybrook and Women's College, but you will find him more or less at uh, Women's College Hospital, okay? So now over at Sunnybrook, if you're having problems with urology, number one place that I know of is Sunnybrook for urology. And that's where I said Dr. Leslie Carr is, who I I can't even go there because I'm just gonna cry like a baby again. Uh, I just love you, Leslie, and I know you know that. Um, but for you guys, that is a great place to go. That's where Dr. Nam is. There's Dr. Hirshhorn, Dr. Sender Hirshhorn. They all work kind of together. Um, and they run the clinic there, and it is amazing. And then Jason Sawyer, he is on the acute pain team, and he runs it. I call him, he has a mobile office, because it doesn't, it's not like he can just sit in a room and have an office, because his office is on his feet. He is constantly on the go, whether it's showing up in the emergency department or when you get admitted, he comes up to the floor and he'll, he's the kind of guy that he cares so much about what he does. And even when I met him in, in 2000, I said 12. No, it was 2002. Sorry, because it's been a long time that I've known him. It was 2002. When he was still learning, he was still going to school because he wanted to be a doctor. Okay, but he was a nurse at the time, just a, a registered nurse at the time. But he was still working with the pain management group. And he would not leave until I was okay. Like, I swear. Or he, if he had to run to the desk, he would be like, okay, Sant, I'm coming right back. I'm, I'm going to go do a couple things at the desk and then I'm coming back to check on you. And he did. He always did. And this went on for years. And there were times when I was on the bed crying like a baby because my life was over and I never thought I could get through. He would sit on the edge of the bed with me and he'd let me cry on his shoulder. And he would have pep talks with me. And that guy, he gave me hope. He gave me courage and he showed me the strength that I had inside me to continue. He is an amazing uh, specialist. And I've watched him go through his education. I watched him become a nurse practitioner and then take over the whole um, acute pain team and put together the whole thing with the LEAP program with all of the girls there. So uh, 
I mean, there's so much more in bigger city hospitals, like in teaching facilities. And that's where you need to go. I'm not telling you, you have to go to Toronto. But if you're from around here, you're not going to find the health in Sarnia, which is where we're from. You're, you're not going to get it there because they're not, they don't see enough of it every day. We live in a small town. But if you, London, hey, that's a good place to go. Go to London because it's university teaching um, hospitals too. Western University, Fanshawe College. So there's lots of um, doctors that are excellent in London. I just happened to end up in Toronto and I don't want to go anywhere else but Toronto. Excuse me. So, then the last thing is to journal. I said you need to journal because you will be amazed. Today you might say, oh, come on. I don't want to journal. But you will realize it'll go by fast. Trust me. In another six months from now, you're going to go back and read what you wrote. And it's going to affect you. And it's going to affect you in a positive way. Even though it might make you cry a little bit because you're going to feel sorry for the person that you're reading about. Like you're reading somebody else's story. It's going to help you. Okay? So, journaling. You got to do it. If you're going to follow this little path here. And then, the deep breathing is going to be crucial. So, next video, I am going to start with some relaxation and I'm going to show you how we deep breathe because that is a huge um, coping mechanism for dealing with pain. So with that, I know I ran a little bit longer. I'm sorry, but these things are important. They are the, the whole reason why I exist to this day other than my lovely children which are children anymore they're grown-ups <laughs> um brock and brandon and lauren those are my kids right now and i'm waiting for some grandkids one day but it's gonna be a while so they're the fire under my feet and they're what kept me going my whole life i used to take little photo albums to the hospital with me and they would be with there with me all the time um yeah so next video you're gonna need a pillow we're gonna play some music i have my diffuser going with some really nice oils and i'm gonna walk you through the deep breathing exercises so be prepared make sure you have a pillow you might want to start taking notes so but you can always rewatch my videos because you'll have them right once I upload them, they're yours, and you can share them. You, in actual fact, I want you to share them. I want you to be proactive, and if you know somebody that's going through something, I want you to send this to them to help them out, because I'm on a mission here, guys. Um, this isn't just for nothing. There is an ending to this, and it's an ending of the suffering. And I'm hoping that you take this and it works for you. If it doesn't, if there's something that you have an opinion about, um, please comment down below, you know, down below. Uh, also subscribe. Um, subscribe you know, on you guys that would be over here. And hit the notification button so that every time I upload a video, you'll get a notification. But please leave comments because it's like one thing to say, oh, good job, Sandy, you're doing a good job. That's okay and that's great and I love you guys for doing that. But I want to hear from those of you who are going through the disease process. I want to hear what's, what you're feeling. I want to hear what you need from me. Is there something else I can help you with? Um, I know, like I have a lot of topics to cover, but 
whatever it is you need of me, I want you to comment down below, okay? And like I said, share. And look, I have to show you this because I just got it and I'm so excited. It is a pillow case. Nevertheless, she persisted. This is me to a T. I love it. I had to get it. I got it off the Wish app, believe it or not. So I love Wish. I get so many things from them and they're cheap, but they're awesome. So this is a pillowcase. So if you know a girl, I know there's got, I wish there was one that said he too, but you could, you could kind of scribble out yes and put he persisted. So if you know someone that's gone through a lot and they're strong and they're continuing and they're not giving up, nevertheless, she or he persisted. Why not? That would be a really good gift to give to someone. So I got it for myself. Because I felt I needed something. A little bit of deserving. Some love. Right? So guys. I hope that today's video has been helpful. And let me know if you want to hear music while I'm talking. That was brought up by my son. And I'm not sure if that would interfere or not. But let me know. Just tell me what you think. Tell me how you're feeling. Tell me what you want to know more of, what you want to hear. And you can even tell me how awful I look. <laughs> or you can tell me how good I look. I don't care. Uh, today's not been a great day, so I really don't have any makeup on. Just a little lip balm and I did do my mascara because I thought I needed to give you guys a little bit of something. But I'm having some issues, so need to get that addressed and I will but you guys are my number one priority right now so with that take it take good care and appreciate autoimmunity love God love yourself give yourself a hug and don't be afraid to tell people how you feel it's okay I love you and hope to hear from you and don't forget, subscribe. Okay, bye guys and gals.